Miles of beaches, sunny skies, and a worsening hepatitis outbreak. Is the homeless crisis putting a dent in San Diego's tourism industry? Developers say tiny homes could be an environmentally sound solution for the housing crisis. So why are owners in the county living in undisclosed locations? And buildings all over San Diego bear the philanthropist's name, but a legal fight within the Conrad Previs Foundation is holding up donations. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Lori Weisberg. She covers tourism and hospitality for the San Diego Union Tribune. Hi, Lori. Hi there. Good to see you today. Reporter James DeHaven, also with the Union Tribune. Hi, James. Hi, Mark. Good to see you today. KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John. Hi, Allison. Hi, Mark. Glad to have you back. And reporter John Wilkins, also with the Union Tribune. Hi, John. Hello, Mark. Glad you're here today. Well, is San Diego at risk of becoming the typhoid Mary of convention cities? That's what some people are wondering as some convention planners express concerns over the impact of our hepatitis A outbreak on visitors. And Lori reported this week, one convention may have uh, backed out, pulled out over concerns here. There's some question about all of that. Tell us about that, who was it and, and what are they saying? Uh, this is CookieCon, and they are going to also be having a convention up in LA in February. But they, um, there is, as you say, difference of opinion. The the convention center corporation says it offered the CookieCon the option to reschedule, um, and and CookieCon did reschedule, and then they found another convention to take their place, and now CookieCon's not coming at all uh, next year. But CookieCon on its Facebook page, on its Facebook page says. They're concerned, you know, there's gonna be a lot of test, a lot of sampling of, of confections and pastries, and gee, maybe it's not a good idea with this, uh, with this outbreak of hepatitis A that we that we're coming there. Um, the convention center corporation responded with a cease and desist letter because they thought that was spreading a bad message about San Diego because nobody else is canceling and they won't even uh, they won't characterize it as a cancellation, but CookieCon does characterize it that way. And Mayor Faulkner just a few moments ago on Midday Edition told Maureen Cavanaugh that, uh, oh, you know, that story is overblown and all. But it all raises the concern of what we're talking about here is, is San Diego suddenly getting a, a cloud, a black mark, because of this uh, this health crisis? Yeah, and in the same way that the, the mayor and the rest of the city and the county are working over time to do physical things like vaccinations and hand washing stations to, to combat this, the Tourism Authority and the Convention Center are working very hard to combat that public perception that there's a danger. Now, there are uh, some pretty big conventions coming to town um, in the next few weeks. Um, they did raise questions, and they've t tried to reassure their membership. They're not canceling. Um, mm -hmm. Ironically, one of the groups that's coming is the in it's Infectious Disease Week. Oh, <laughs> perfect. We well, they, they can have a hands-on uh, experiment right here. Right in town. there. We're yeah, yeah, we're a test case. So, and obviously, they they know enough about hepatitis A and the and vaccinations and that, that it's not a concern. But mm -hmm. but of course, it does create a cloud. The Tourism Authority has something on their website trying to reassure people, and here's some resources mm -hmm. for you, and this is what's being done. But of course, you run the risk of people getting cold feet. But you should know that with conventions, the larger ones, they're booked years in mm -hmm. advance, and it would be pretty hard to cancel, unlike CookieCon, it's mm -hmm. much smaller, and it, it was an easier easier change for them to make. Well, that segues us into a, a bite we have here. Dr. Uh, Nick Eventides, he's the uh, county medical officer. Here's what he says overall about concerns on the outbreak. There is, with appropriate sanitation, uh, no reason for the general, otherwise healthy population to have over concern about this. All right, and James, uh, remind us, just give us a, a sense of the scope of this uh, you wrote about this week and, and, and remind <clears throat> us uh, how bad this sure. outbreak is. Uh, since November, it's uh, killed 16 people, uh, hospitalized 300 others, apparently sickened something like uh, 400 people. Uh, that's as many as, uh, or, or I guess I should say, there's been as many hepatitis cases uh, in San Diego since November as there was in all of California, Texas, and I believe New York in 2015. Which, which is, is the most recent year they most recent looked year. at that. So it's a big deal. And Lori, you mentioned that those cookie folks are going to LA. They announced this week, it was in the newspaper in the Los Angeles Times, they've got an outbreak up there as well. They do, but as, as James mentioned, it pales in comparison. Yeah. I mean, I think they've got maybe 10 cases they identified mm -hmm. when the last story that, that I read, 
10 compared in a much to, bigger city, to 400. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's it's a fraction. All right. I guess well, it's Allison? still relatively small compared to how many people get the flu, which after all, the flu can be a really mm -hmm. serious problem. Right, right. Absolutely. However, you know, when they say 70% of the people who are implicated are, are among the homeless population, um, that implies 30% are not. And so I think it is it does behoove us to see that this is something that affects the whole community and not right. just the... John? Is there any sense, Laurie, in the convention world that regular tourists are starting to be concerned about it? People who might be coming here to just vacation? No, I think that's probably... Because it's just, so, you know, a few people here and there at different hotels. What I did do was I did contact um, one of the bigger hotels where uh, Manchester Grand Hyatt where they have um, they have a lot of groups of their own coming in and that's a better indication they did acknowledge that they had a couple groups that have already come here but they inquired about it and out of concern and again they were reassured and they're coming so so far I don't think it's probably reaching down to the the tourist level the bigger concern is when you have hundreds if not thousands of people coming for meetings that's where they, they were really concerned about and, and of course hygiene is at the the middle of this this is the at-risk population the homeless folks down there and there's been a lot talking uh, of talk about hand washing stations and more toilets and I want to shift uh, uh, James to, to your story this week about the lack of toilets downtown and the, the warnings the city had going back years yeah uh, as far back as 2000 a city council advisory committee had told them you know look we're seeing a, a rising homeless population and a static number of bathrooms. And so that sort of logically results in uh, the streets being used as toilets. Um, they called for additional street cleaning so as to prevent exposure to uh, human waste out there. And uh, a grand jury picked up on, on that report uh, back in 2004. Mm -hmm. And they've warned about it several times since then. Now, what specifically did these reports uh, say to the city council? What should have been done about this? Uh, the 2004 report uh, wanted more street cleaning, pretty much the same as the 2000 uh, City Council Advisory Committee. And what they're actually doing now, of course. Right. Yeah. Uh, the 2005 and 2010 reports wanted more street cleaning and more bathrooms. The 2015 report wanted more bathrooms and then pointed out that, you know, we've been asking for this for more than a decade. Mm -hmm. And why didn't the city build more bathrooms with this uh, this looming crisis? They talked about liability, too, right? I, I, yes. Uh, liability was mentioned in the 2010 report. They said if you don't get this stuff cleaned up, it could potentially result in a, uh, you know, an outbreak mm -hmm. um, that could pose liability for the city. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the answer to why they didn't build more restrooms is because they're uh, expensive, and, and not very popular. Um, a lot of people feel that they just attract more homeless people if you bring them in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the city spent something like a half million dollars to um, build two of them that they ended up removing mm -hmm. at a certain point. So I think there's an element of, of gun shyness there. Mm -hmm. So I, I, guess, I guess, I don't know if we'll ever know like which single factor contributed the most to this outbreak. But I mean, do you get the sense it's a combination of not enough bathrooms, not enough hand washing stations, not enough regular bleaching down the streets. Is it is it all that together? Was was the city criticized for not doing enough of cumulative stuff, or is it is it mostly the bathrooms? They they were criticized on all of those fronts, and I think it is a combination of those things that contributes to something like this. Because the city's had a homeless problem for a long time, but at some point, a corner was turned and. This and, happened. And it's getting worse. The, Allison? I gotta say, it seems to me that, that more bathrooms is the answer because uh, cleaning the streets with bleach, I hate to think what that's doing to our environment. I mean, we have all these signs that says, don't put oil down the drains. Mm -hmm. That water is going somewhere. And mm -hmm. if we do that on a regular basis, ongoingly over months, what is going to happen to the to the creatures where that water I, ends I think up? it's a good question. I, I wish I had an answer for you, but I yeah. think that's definitely worth looking into mm -hmm. because it does, it drains into There's the ocean. Yeah. Right. Well. I have a, a bite here I want to get to from Mary. Kevin Faulkner again on uh, Midday Edition here just a short while ago and Maureen Cavanaugh asked about why the city had failed to build more public restrooms. Here's his uh, comment. I, I can say unequivocally our conversations are all about how we getting people the help that they need right now. Uh, not looking back for really bringing everybody together uh, in an unprecedented fashion. All right, so he's not really <laughs> addressing what happened, yeah. doesn't want to look backward. He said that a couple of I, times. I mean, that's reminiscent of what he and other city officials have told me when I asked a, a similar question. Um, that's that's their position, and uh, I, I guess they're sticking to it. Mm -hmm. you know? So what is the city finally doing? Is there something in the pipeline to, to pay for or fund these uh, more bathrooms? And we mentioned that, of course, they're bleaching streets they've and added washing a, stations. Yeah, they've added a couple new bathroom sites, and they've uh, expanded hours at uh, something like a dozen or more of the Balboa Park restrooms that were already there. 
So um, that seems to be helping, or I hope it's helping. Okay. All right, do John? You, do you have some sense of how our San Diego's public restroom numbers compare to some other cities? Uh, it's interesting. The comparison the grand juries used uh, over and over again was San Francisco, which has uh, 25 downtown restrooms mm -hmm. that, if I remember correctly, they are open 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And that was another thing the grand jury really emphasized is whatever bathrooms are added, they wanted to be 24 hours um, accessible to the street population, right. you know, just as our bathrooms at our homes are accessible to us at all times. So if they have 25, how many would we have? We, we have 21 today okay. as of the latest, uh, yeah, you know, b uh, the ones added in the past week or so. Okay, so more coming along. Well, we'll certainly be watching this story as it unfolds, and fortunately it uh, doesn't appear to be going anywhere, anywhere soon. Yeah. We're going to move on. Uh, they were to be the antithesis of the McMansion, tiny homes. They're inexpensive, don't require much space, of course, friendly to the environment, could help a a lot with our affordable housing crisis. But then the theory ran into reality. Uh, Allison, start just by defining this. What is a tiny home? Well, a tiny home really is tiny. It's smaller than a mobile home, for example. It could be like 300 square feet. Um, they, they vary in size, but they are really quite small and more like a, a large caravan. And uh, the problem is that they don't have any kind of classification right now. They're being classified either as RVs or mobile homes, but in many cases they're actually smaller than, than either of those, and they have a very different sort of set of requirements if you're going to actually live in one. And we'll get into some of those details. What would it cost to build a tiny house? They're very affordable, right? Uh, well, yes, I think it's probably cheaper than constructing a, a, a normal size house, but it's not necessarily if you want a well-constructed one going to be that much cheaper. And the people I spoke to said, uh, one of them said 50000 was about the least that he could build one for. Someone else said, if you're going to build it in California, seventy, eighty, ninety thousand 90000 is about as cheap as you can get. So, you know, you might think, oh, less than 100000 great, I'll go for it. But that is just the least of it. The building the house is the, the rub least is of it. The rub is where are you going to put it, right? Where are you going to put it? It's the land. I mean, that's our problem here in San Diego is land, land mm. use. We're shrinking land. And it turns out that there, um, there really is not a blazed trail for where to put tiny homes. And that applies to either individual tiny homes in the backs of people's yard or communities of tiny homes, which is something that's sparking quite a bit of interest. Mm -hmm. Lori? It, it sort of reminds me of the, uh, the, Airbnb, the Airbnb short term vacation rental debate. They mm -hmm. said there's nothing in the whole debate, they're, they're really illegal because there's nothing in the municipal code, in San Diego at least, that defines a short term rental and therefore they're illegal unless you start putting them into the code. So are you seeing efforts to start putting language in the codes in various jurisdictions so that they're suddenly legal and that's no longer a... Uh, well, I think the tiny homes people would like there to be some language being put into the codes. Um, uh, as far as I can see, the motivation for the regulators to start developing language is probably stronger when it comes to homeless uh, encampments. And there are some states, Oregon and Washington, where tiny home communities have taken off mainly to help house the homeless. So there you actually have a motivation for the, for the red tape folks to you know, develop some kind of a, a protocol that will work. I, I, I don't know what is going to push the, um, the envelope for people who are wanting perhaps to build more sustainable communities, you know, who say this is a smaller uh, ecological footprint and we want to downsize, we want to simplify, we want to live in community. Those are the folks that I think um, they're going to have a hard time getting some zoning that will meet their needs. And KPBS had reported uh, last year about kind of a, a model community and a dream to to see, hey, this can be done. Here's here's how we're going to do it. But it's been kind of a bust, right? right? Claire Dragaser and a few other uh, media outlets actually profiled this uh, project. Um, Janet Ashworth in uh, Escondido, and then Poway, who who was promising a community of, of small mobile homes, and it sounded very attractive. She managed no trouble at all to get quite a lot of people to invest. Uh, she said maybe 30 people gave her a deposit. And some people gave her a lot more than just a $1,000 deposit, like $60,000 in some cases, to build uh, their tiny homes. But she, she ran into this problem that she couldn't, she bought a piece of property, she could not get the zoning changed in time. So the money that she had ran out uh, and she needed more money to keep paying that mortgage. And, and I think this is what developers face, is that risk of can you get the zoning changed to meet your needs before your money runs out? Mm -hmm. And in her case, it, it, it uh, crashed and burned, and all her depositors mm -hmm. lost their money. John, so what's she hoping to put on that property? Well, she had about 30 people interested. We're going to build on the same place. That was going to build on the same place, right. How many of them would have actually been 
included in the project, maybe more like 20, but right. you know, I mean, it was a substantial community she was hoping to build. Now you think that the, uh, the tiny homes, uh, and, and of course this directly affects the homeless problem too, in terms of right. affordable housing, more housing, but you had a housing commission report just this week, you think it would be good news for the, the people who want to push the, the tiny homes? They say we need to triple the number of, of homes here, get rid of some of the hurdles you're talking about. Yes. What this, did that report say? This report is a real wake-up call. I mean, you know, 220,000 more homes be, by in the next 10 years, which is, you know, like 20,000 homes a year. And at the moment, we're building, if we're lucky, 10,000 homes a year. Usually it's much less than that. So, so way more than we're building. Way now. more than we're building, you know. Yeah. And they had five suggestions, including, you know, using more empty land and rezoning industrial land and making it easier to build accessory dwelling units which I mm. think is the closest thing you can get to a tiny home but even those in some cases are bigger than tiny homes and even those require huge amounts of um, code and regulations that make it um, pretty expensive when you're actually you know looking at the final costs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well that gets me to kind of the basic step back question here is we're We've understood this housing crisis here. We've understood it across the state of California. And lawmakers here, have, they've done a, you know, a symbolic thing. We're gonna have 250 million raised with these little fees mm -hmm. and we're gonna help some homeless and, mm -hmm. and affordable housing, et cetera, which seems like nothing in the state this size. Why aren't we seeing the red tape cut and people addressing this issue more, more mm -hmm. aggressively? Well, I think we actually are beginning to see the red tape cut. I think, you know, I mean, there was uh, new legislation in January from the state which made it easier for the cities to pass different ordinances for accessory dwellings. Mm -hmm. So it, it's literally just this year that has become mm -hmm. a political crisis. And I think that we will start seeing the results of some of this legislation. And whether it'll be um, people will like it, I don't know, because the regulations are there to protect our quality of life, and people have really fought to maintain that, and those are beginning to loosen now. Laura, you got the last word on okay. this segment. Um, <laughs> in your report, I thought you said um, that there is one person. He said he's going ahead in the spring with mm -hmm. the tiny homes community. So how is he able to do it, given these Well, I think he is, he is hoping, just like the woman who lost all her money, he is hoping that he will be able to overcome those obstacles. And uh, so the point of my piece was to say, beware, you know, this could, may not be as easy as you think. And Meanwhile, they're hiding out in backcountry locations and <laughs> sneaking <laughs> yeah. about. There are a, a lot of homes. people who are managing it behind the scenes. The stealth but. homes. Well, we'll see what happens to follow up uh, on that and see how that story goes. Well, visit the zoo, the Old Globe Theater, San Diego State's campus, any of several medical institutions, you'll see the name Conrad Prebus prominently displayed. The Prebus Foundation has also been supporting some KPBS programming. The billionaire real estate titan who died last year was known as one of the world's most generous philanthropists. But now, uh, big gifts from his billion dollar estate sit in legal limbo waiting to be distributed. The court battle stems from the will Prebus left when he died from cancer last year. So John, start with this uh, disinheritance that's at the center of this story. So Conrad Prebus had one child, Eric Prebus. Uh, who grew up to be a physicist, physicist, particle physicist, very smart guy. Um, he uh, didn't know his dad basically until he was 16. Conrad Prebus grew up in uh, Indiana, uh, tried to make a go of it in several different kinds of businesses there and then moved to San Diego in his early 30s and left behind a wife and a two-year-old son. Mm -hmm. And so um, this, uh, this is where the will had, and of course this will, would have a number of very profound gifts. We're talking about a, a fortune worth well over a billion dollars, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, that Conrad Prebus uh, left, and uh, his son is is not in this will as it was written. And yeah. So the tr the trust has over a dozen sort of separate gifts that he set up over the years, and one of them he did set up for his son Eric, and at one time it had uh, something close to forty million dollars in it, and then uh, starting in 2014, um, he cut that back to 20 million and then to zero. Okay. Now, um, let's go back a moment to uh, Conrad Previs, a man who has built this fortune. How did he amass that fortune? Where did this money yeah, come from? Yeah, he was from? kind of a quiet guy. You know, when he first came in here and as he amassed his uh, wealth, he got into real estate at just the right time. You know, he would find vacant lots and build starter homes and then sell those. and Eventually amassed a fortune of some hundred different buildings and close to 9,000 different units. Mm -hmm. Now, it was interesting in your story, as you mentioned a moment ago, um, that Eric Previs was, was excluded in in the will itself as you described it in the story i mean it's underlined it's like this money isn't going to this person that, yeah so all those, clear, all right? those separate gifts that i was talking about and in each one of those he the, the language says i'm specifically excluding eric Prebus from it
So how is it then that Eric Prevost was successful after his father's well, death in actually getting a settlement? And we'll get to the details of that in a moment. Yeah, I mean, it, it, obviously in an instance like this, there's a huge amount of emotion involved. And at some point, money becomes a substitute for other things. You know, Eric Prebis worked very hard starting at age 16 to an establish a relationship with his father. He thought he had done that. Mm -hmm. um, Conrad Prebis went out and visited Eric Prebis and his two sons in Illinois every summer for a number of years mm -hmm. um, around the July 4th holiday. Uh, they saw each other two, three times every year, talked fairly regularly on the phone. As far as he knew, he still had a relationship with his father. It wasn't close, but they mm -hmm. got along, as he mm -hmm. says. So. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and Eric had come out here and visited him when they'd rekindle this relationship. Uh, and Eric Previs came out and visited him when he was sick. He yeah. was visited him in the hospital near the end. Okay. So, uh, it, he's excluded from this will, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Previs had uh, another person in his life who's at the center of this dispute, right? Debbie Turner, his mm. longtime companion. Um, they've been together for close to 17 years, lived together as a couple, um, very close. To him, she was the president. She is the president of the Conrad Prebis Foundation mm -hmm. Board. Mm -hmm. So, and she's the one who says that uh, Conrad was adamant that Eric get no money. And what was the reason behind that? She won't talk about it, and okay. it's not mentioned specifically in the court papers, mm -hmm. um, which makes it a little bit uh, hard for those of us on the outside to understand all the ins and outs. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, Allison? I guess I feel like you know, like you were saying, the money is replacing emotion. And for a man where money was this successful. It's tragic how much pain he must have been feeling to actually have to cut off his only son. I mean, that would involve a lot of pain, and I feel bad that he had to die with that situation. And you've got to wonder whether Debbie Turner made any efforts to help her, her partner overcome this, if this was such an issue in his life. Yeah, the only, the only thing that uh, Debbie talked about in my discussion with her about this was she felt really bad that Eric had not reached out to try and make some kind of reconciliation with his father and, you know, Eric's position is he had no idea they were even in an argument, um, that his father had never said to him, I'm mad at you about X, Y, and Z. That's where you wonder why Debbie didn't reach out to Eric and say, are you yeah. aware? You know, and again, there's, there's a suggestion in this legal documents and in this court fight that Conrad Prebis was suffering from some form of dementia. I think everyone agrees that there was some form of that at the very end of his life. How much earlier that was happening no That's one knows, but anyone, anybody who's ever had someone with dementia in their life will know that they, something that could happen that becomes a grievance in their mind and becomes huge mm -hmm. without the other person even knowing about it. So. Lori? Did you feel like at the end of all your reporting, which was pretty extensive, did you feel that it ultimately came down to kind of the, one of those classic he said, she said stories? And did you ever feel like a sense of who to believe after this? Um, it was just, or was Not it too really. difficult to really? Not really. I mean, I think both people have very strong emotions about it. They both insist that they're looking out for Conrad Prebis's legacy. And I just think those emotions become entangled in all this. You know, there's, there were some hard feelings at the funeral. It was when Eric first got a sense that maybe something was wrong, he says, mm. um, when he didn't get to participate in ways that maybe he thought he might as the only child. So I think that was some of it that finally got him to uh, say, I, I need to do something about this. Now let's talk about the specifics here. Uh, we, we mentioned he was excluded from the will, yet uh, the board voted four to one, uh -huh. uh, uh, Ms. Turner not voting in that uh, with the other group, uh, to give him a settlement, which totaled, totaled about $15 million, that included paying yeah. estate taxes and all. How did he, he manage that? He had a lawsuit and they settled it. He didn't have a lawsuit. No. He just threatened a he lawsuit. He threatened a lawsuit. Yeah, and he's not, he's not named in these legal papers. He's not a party to it at all, okay. except as this sort of acting party on what set all this in motion. Okay. No, the, the majority of the board heard from Eric Prebis, decided that it made uh, business sense to do this. If you look at the money involved, a billion dollars, you know, he got, what, 1% of that roughly. Mm -hmm. um, it's a significant percentage less than he would have received if he had not been disinherited. Mm -hmm. I think the members of the board decided it, uh, it made a lot of business sense to do it this way so they could get on with the business of mm -hmm. distributing the money that, that Conrad Prebis left behind to be distributed to charity. And Debbie Turner now is suing the board over that decision and saying you, you shouldn't do this, you have to honor this will. Yeah, and she really has no way to peel the money back from him, so she's, she's suing the other board members to make them reimburse the money plus mm -hmm. damages. And what does the, uh, the attorneys for the defendants, the board members, have to say about this? Well, they, again, they argue that it was a, that it was a sound business decision, that, the, that Lori Ann Victoria, who is longtime business associate of Conrad Prebis and the 
and the trustee here had all the, uh, all the power and authority to do this, to settle challenges against mm -hmm. the estate, and so she did that. And they argue that this suit from Debbie Turner is mainly because she's angry at any suggestion that she exerted undue influence over Conrad. Okay, a couple seconds left. What's the status of this suit? This could go on a while. It's very early, it's very early. They had their first court hearing uh, earlier this week to just sort of set some more dates and get ready to go. Mm -hmm. So a lot of money tied up, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're they're actually issuing IOUs to some of the charities that are in line. Who would for normally get money. funding and it's all just kind of in lim legal limbo as it yeah. goes. Well, we'll see what happens yeah. as it moves along. Well, that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Lori Weisberg, San Diego Union Tribune, and James DeHaven, also of the Union Tribune, Allison St. John of KPBS News, and John Wilkins, also of the Union Tribune. Union Tribune week here. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable.